Hey there friends, Dave Pilatus, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. And this is a missing person segment. And right away I'm going to say some thank yous to some people. Who uh, One lady sent this really cool ball for Huck. So what she said, hey Dave, I wanted to send this ball to Huck for quite a while. Finally got around to it. I hope she enjoys it. And oh yeah. She enjoys it. Thank you. Hope you're able to read my letter with the handwriting. Thank you again, Dave. Hope to see you in person at some point. I wanted to go to the MUFON conference, but was unable. Maybe next time. Sincerely, Linda. Well, Linda, I'm sure we will meet someday soon, hopefully. Another individual, another letter read this one to you. So this is Dear Dave, just wanted to tell you that we have enjoyed your videos and are thankful for the work you do. Your kindness and commitment to the people who help upon help gives us a little more faith in humankind. We wanted to send you this book with a prayer that your searching heart may see the conflict in a little different light. Read the last eight chapters first, then go back to the beginning and read the historical context. Keep up the great work with your prayers, Steve and Sheila. Here's the book it's called The Great Controversy. Let me read you what it says on the back. Discover how freedom's past has been written through the sacrifice of men and women who stood up for a cause greater than themselves. Experience how the struggle for religious freedom through the Dark Ages shaped the foundation of the U.S. Constitution and see how free choice is central to God's character. Gain the hope that millions have found through understanding biblical prophecies and show God's ultimate triumph through his love for everyone on earth. Thank you for that. I greatly appreciate these things and I read a lot. <laughs> a lot and I've told people that I'm a mile wide and an inch deep I know a lot about different things and I know a lot about a lot of things but there's very few things I know a lot a lot about well, yeah there's some things I do but I try to keep in contact with all the things in there that that may affect my work and on a regular basis I'm always reading something. Uh, as an example, when I'm uh, at the gym pumping iron, I have a book with me. In between sets, I'm reading. <laughs> People think I'm crazy. I don't socialize, I read. You know, I go down there to do a job, I read. And so, Angie and I were on the cruise. And some people came up to us and said, hey Dave, this must be something really unusual for you. You get to relax on a ship and have some great food. And Angie starts laughing. She goes, oh, you nailed that on the head. This guy works like 14 hours a day and he never stops. He's a machine. And I suppose she's the victim of that. And I apologize to her all the time, but it's kind of what's kept my sanity during some of these insane times that we've gone through. I'm talking about anything political or country-wise. I'm just talking about my own little world that I'm in. So thank you. Thank you for thinking about Huck and I and Angie. So, as I've stated, every once in a while I'll come across a missing persons case that is just really different. And I'll go the extra extent and I'll try to find periphery issues that have happened around it and just make it a high focus incident. That's what this is today. When we found this case, a lot of things about it struck out at us. It's happened in upper New York, a missing hunter, a 17 year old boy. And kind of the way it rolled out, that area of New York intrigues me because I've, I know a lot about it. And 
kind of the results of what they found and didn't find, as you'll see, are troublesome. So the name of the young man was Stephen Zathmari. 17 years old, went missing November 23rd, 1961. And they were hunting in an area called the Zor Valley, northern New York, Cattaraugus County. Now, Stephen lived in Wheatfield, New York, and attended North Tonawanda High School. And when he wasn't going to school, he worked. He was a farmhand outside of Wheatfield on a big farm. He liked the outdoors. He was very tight with his brothers and his family very tight and the family was extremely religious keep that in mind on november 23rd 61 at about 7 30 a.m his dad named joseph who was 60 brother joe was 20 joe jr and a brother paul 25 the three boys and the dad had driven from their home in wefield to the zor valley to go deer hunting Now, Stephen was the least experienced of them. So they put Stephen on a deer track, not all that far from where they parked their vehicle. And they gave him specific instructions. Stay here, watch that deer track. The three of us are going to come up around and we're going to push the deer down towards you. Stephen says, got it. They said, hey, we'll be back in about three and a half hours and check on you. But don't move, because they're coming your way. He goes, got it. So Joe and the boys went up around. They all saw Stephen bent over, tightening up the laces of his boots, acknowledging that he heard him, and they took off walking up the hill. Well, at about 11 a.m., Joe, and the boys came back to check on Stephen and to grab some lunch. Stephen wasn't around. They went to the car. All the lunches hadn't been touched. So they grabbed a lunch and said, well, he might be out walking around, going to the bathroom, something. So they went back up to the mountains. At 1 p.m., they came back to the car. Stephen's lunch hadn't been touched. Stephen was nowhere to be found. And this time, the boys and the dad were troubled because they knew Stephen wouldn't walk off like that. So the three of them decided to split off, stay within eye distance of each other and start searching for the brother. Stephen was described as an inexperienced hunter, but in tremendous health, good shape, athletic and smart. So the boys and the dad searched and searched and searched and searched, came back to the car, and at 3.30, they said, we're in trouble. And the dad went off and contacted the New York Conservation Department, the wardens for the state of New York. The wardens got in touch with the state police and the Cattaraugus County Sheriff's Department and all three responded. They arrived at the location near the Zor Valley in Cattaraugus, and they interviewed the dad. They interviewed the dad and the brothers, all told the same story. No foul play, no tricky stuff going on. And they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to break up into groups and we'll take this in, in different areas and do a hasty search and get back here before it's really, really dark or too dark. So they all split up. One group led by each law enforcement individual. They got back. It was, it was really dark and they found nothing. They were calling Stephen's name the whole time. They knew something was really wrong. Well, the Conservation Department had already called 
uh, for a state police helicopter and a state police plane for the next day. They called the Civil Air Patrol and asked them to respond. The mechanisms were put in place for a huge response the following day. And on November 24th at 7.30, the first full day of a search and rescue starts. That night, the temperatures had gotten down into the low 40s, not extreme. And helicopters were flying in, planes were in the air, ground pounders were hitting the pavement and the dirt. And the State Conservation Department commander was a, name, a man named Howard Bobsline. He was interviewed by the press. He made some regrettable statements, statements I would have never made. He said, I expect Stephen to be found by late tonight. We have aircraft in the air now. I understand he's an ex inexperienced hunter, but the kid's strong and healthy. That's what he said. Hmm. Well, he knew the area and he felt that it was nearly impossible to disappear in this area and not be found by the amount of people that they had here, over 200. So he felt pretty sure in his statement. The location can best be described as lots of trees, fairly flat ground with a couple deep gullies. Stephen disappeared one quarter mile. That's not far one quarter mile from a farmhouse. That first day when they did the uh, hasty search, they contacted the farmer and said, could you leave all your lights on? The farmer said, sure. So the lights stayed on there all the time. And right through the middle of the search area was Cataragas Creek. Now it was falling pretty good, but it, the people said it wasn't deep enough to drown Stephen. They said there was very, very little chance of him falling and drowning in there. Okay. I understand that. It makes sense. First day, they find nothing. Didn't find tracks. Didn't find anything. Next day, November 25th, the aircraft were in the air again. 200 plus searchers, including Cattaraugus County deputies, game wardens from the state, Erie County deputies from an adjacent county responded on mutual aid. State police had their troopers there. Civil Air Patrol had two planes there. Stephen's brother, Paul, was employed by Remington and many of the people at Remington that he worked with left and volunteered to search. Well, Remington makes rifles, so I, they understand. And Paul was also part of the New York National Guard. His unit heard that Paul's brother Stephen was missing, and like 90% of them volunteered on their own time, not part of the National Guard, just on their own time to come out and help a brother. That's what you call friendship and love. So they had way over 200 people this time. Uh, New York State Conservation Department was the one that was leading the searches since they're the ones that knew the countryside and was well organized. Searchers were working 16 hour days those first two days and they continued for th three more days nonstop. The report that came out was there was no, no torn clothing, no missing clothing that was found, no tracks, essentially no clues. Many people and newspaper articles made the statement that they wondered if he was really in the area. Some people think he ran away. There was no, no one in the family or friends that supported that, though. 
When the formal search and rescue ended after five days, the family decided to really put it into gear. They got family from many areas of the Eastern US, friends, work associates, school friends, hunters, all assisted in continuing the search and rescue. On the 4th of December, Mr. and Mrs. Zathmari said that they couldn't give up. They wouldn't give up. They ended up taking the family dog to the spot where Stephen was last seen. Dog didn't even react. In January through April 62, the family continued to go to the same spot every weekend. The father gave another interview and said that when Stephen disappeared, he and the boys were not that far from where Stephen was standing. So it was even more explicable in their minds. Joe and Vera, the mom, told the press that they drive to the same spot in the Zora Valley every Sunday. Friends, I gotta tell you something. I've done a lot of these cases. I get it. I understand. So many families are in this position. It's like you can't wrap your head around your son just vanishing. Stephen was a good kid. Clean cut kid. Honorable. Loved his family. Unbelievable what happened here. So this is the area that they were hunting in the Zor Valley, right off of 40 Road. I'll do it real close for you. 40, 40 Road. It's about 20 miles from here to Lake Erie. Now, why am I telling you that? Well, first of all, I've done another case where a boy disappeared right here, within 20 miles of here. And I've done cases all around Lake Erie where people have disappeared. Now, where the Zathmaris lived was up here, just north of Buffalo. Not a long drive. This area, very, still very rural and rugged. A little more up close. This is Cataragus Creek. This is the area of the disappearance. This is the area they were searching. A little up close for you. Got it? Not knowing what happened can kill your heart. I've talked to so many people that this has happened to. It's like it compromises your soul. So they drove, the Zathmaris drove there every Sunday. Mrs. Zathmari said she refuses to believe Stephen was shot or ran away. She said he was too close to his brothers and his parents ever to leave. The family stated that Stephen even if he was gone for a day in the middle of the day, would call his mom and just check in with her. He loved his brothers immensely, loved doing things with the brothers and the dad as they were doing when he disappeared. It was an extremely loving group. Now we go fast forward to May 1962. The original incident happened November 23rd, 61. So about six months later. A family was picnicking in the Zor Valley, adjacent to Cataragus Creek that I just showed you. And one of their small kids went running out into the creek. It wasn't very deep. It was about four inches deep at that time. And found something there, called the parent over. The dad comes over, and it's a shotgun laying in the creek. 
He called the Cattaraugus County Sheriff. They picked it up and they knew right away, hmm, this could be evidence if it's Stevens. Well, they brought it and showed it to Mr. Zafmari, and he confirmed that was Stevens' gun. And he told the press, as did the deputies, that the gun was found quite a distance from where Stephen disappeared, but they never stated what that distance was. Now, Mr. Zathmari said something that was very interesting to me. He stated that in his opinion, that gun didn't show as much rust as it should have if it was in that creek for six months. They never said if the gun was still loaded, if it was empty. So that was in May of 62. Well, there was a massive search in that area. They didn't find anything else. They didn't say it was upstream, downstream from where he was last seen. That's all that was said. Now, let's, <clears throat> let's forward, fast forward about another year and a half. November 1963. The Zathmaris hold a press conference. Now, at this point, Stephen's been missing almost two years. His spirit, November 61. It's now November 63. They're getting desperate. Every Sunday, they've been going out searching for their son. They haven't found anything. And I should say that friends and family kept going out searching as well, weren't finding anything. So the Zathmari's at the press conference said that they would not prosecute anyone if they came forward now and stated that they accidentally shot Stephen and concealed the body. Some of you may say, wow, how could they ever say that? I understand. Because knowing where your son's at and wrapping your head around what happened would be a better way to walk out of your life than not knowing. They say that they couldn't live a lifetime wondering what happened to their son. That was their words. Well, there was no response. This got national attention. Then 1965 rolls around. Cattaraugus County Sheriff Charles Hill is questioned about Stephen's case. He stated that the shotgun was found in an area where the water was about four inches deep. He stated when Stephen vanished, the creek was a little deeper. He didn't say how much deeper. He said, and I'll quote him, absolutely nothing else has turned up on this case but they still consider it an open case. Mr. Zathmari at this press conference made a big statement. Let me quote him for you. He said, I find it impossible to believe that my son could vanish so completely without some trace. Somebody, somewhere, must know something. Let's pretend for a second. I've got a pretty good viewership on this channel. I know I've got people all over North America watching. If you know something about Stephen's case, send me a note anonymously. These kind of things you need to clear your soul sometimes. It's been so many years, they're never going to prosecute anyone for anything now, anyhow. Most people are probably deceased, but maybe you had a brother or father or someone told you a story. 
I'm going to bet that Stephen's brothers are still alive. So, I'd like to know what happened to Stephen. So he disappeared adjacent to Cataraugus Creek water. He was a hunter, a subgroup of a group that went missing. No tracks were found. They brought a dog to the scene, it never reacted. And, point of separation. When Stephen separated from his dad and his two brothers, something happened. How many times have I said that to you over the years? And a lot of people write in, make comments on the videos, make fun of me for saying that. Oh, I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. Maybe. But I don't think so. If the Zafmari family was around today, I'd give him a big hug and I'd join in prayer. Now, something I did on this case, I know this area pretty well. I've written about it a lot. It's got a lot of strangeness in it. So let me start off with a couple of UFO stories from this area. Tonawanda, New York, just north of where this incident happened. From the UFO Reporting Center, April 30th, 2023, just recently reported, spotted two anomalies around 3 a.m. below the cloud overcast while it was raining in our area. Well, that's interesting, raining. Lights on the object, aura or haze around it, left a trail and it changed color. Spotted two objects outside my place of employment. Both UAP UFOs were below the clouds. It kept raining off and on. The one closest to the building changed shapes and colors. They stayed stationary in the sky. There's a picture on it. So I'll show it to you. Very strange. I would call that a UFO. Station stationary below cloud level. Yeah, I would call that unusual. Buffalo, New York, just north of where this incident happened. I witnessed two ships or planes traveling at unbelievable high speeds with instant 180 to 90 degree turns. Unrealistic, but I saw it. I've seen the exact same thing when I was camping up in Northern California with a bunch of friends. We all saw it, middle of the night. I witnessed two flying objects traveling at unbelievable speeds in formation for about 10 seconds before I pulled out my camera out to snap only one picture before they disappeared in an instant. Congratulations on getting that picture. Unbelievable, and now I'm definitely a believer now, and I witnessed firsthand something I can't explain. Even all with all the knowledge I've learned in 42 years, I still look at this picture in just amazement. What makes it even better is that it's the North Star Jupiter in the picture when it was snapped. Jupiter at the bottom right here. You can kind of see the other things in the sky. Not a bad picture. Glad somebody was paying attention. And the last one. January, or February 14th, 2010. Me and three close friends were walking through a field during a winter camping trip. This was Gowanda, New York. Not far at all from where this happened. We saw what looked like three stars flying through the sky, but they were on fire and looked to be the size of a close helicopter. We watched as they flew very, very fast through the sky and disappeared past our line of vision. We were completely sober and we felt very uncomfortable. We left our campsite immediately as we no longer felt safe because we didn't know where it landed or where it was going. Oh, but that's not the end, folks. Because I also did some searching for Bigfoot activity in that area. Here we go. Cattaraugus County, New York. October 13th, 2001, about five miles north of the Allegheny State Park. 
I live in Salamanca, New York, was hunting down old 17, hunting down old road 17 and seen a dark, hairy creature walking on two legs across the railroad tracks. The area around him had smelled very bad like a skunk. Before I had seen a Bigfoot, I heard a loud crashing noise and that was my encounter. Other people before had recently seen a tall, dark, hairy creature and they also heard strange noises in the woods. There were three of us. We were all hunting for small game. We were standing together talking when the incident happened. I've heard other stories about sightings a few years back, mainly during the fall and spring season, sometimes during the winter and summer. Outside temperature, 30 to 40 degrees, just like Stephen disappeared. I think that was interesting. Next report. Salamanca, New York, very close. Myself and one other person saw roughly around 10 p.m. This is what the investigator said. I contacted the witness by phone. There was no lapse or uncertainty. He rented a 16 by 16 cabin on the Hamlin Trail with his wife and young son in July 2013. The cabin is rented by New York State Parks and Recreation. as a historical society at Allegheny State Park. That's in North, Southern New York, just south of where this happened. The interior cabin did have lights. He said the lights helped illuminate the exterior front portion of the dark, darkened grounds through non-curtain windows. He immediately grabbed his flashlight, shined it out the front porch window. He was uh, apparently thinking he was going to see a black bear. However, he was startled to see a hulking bipedal creature walking away from the cabin. He observed it to be a minimum of eight feet tall and 600 pounds. Broad shoulders, large chest, long arms that swayed. Sighting was estimated to be at a distance of 30 feet. That's close. Also noted was that the bipedal structure had long grayish to brown hair. He was unable to view any portion of the subject from the waist down due to shrubbery. He did not see the face that was walking away with his back towards it. After waiting inside the cabin for 15 minutes, unsure of what to do next, he decided to open the door and step on the porch. He noticed that his senses were greeted with a foul, wet, dirty odor. Powerful. He stated that when I was asked what the possibility of the bear, he stated that he was a hunter and also a butcher by trade. He has no trouble differentiating any animal from the subject. It was no bear. He said fear came over him for the safety of his family, feeling uncertain and not knowing if the subject was going to turn and return. He and his wife decided to pack their belongings and leave the cabin. He stated that the ride out of the park was 25 minutes, the entire time he was checking his rear view mirror. When asked why he reported this sighting five years after the fact, he stated that he was on social media and was searching for info on the park and noticed an unknown person made a reference about Bigfoot sighting in that park. He decided to contact a member of the Chamber of Commerce and told of his encounter. That chamber member furnished him with our, the website. A lot of sightings in northern New York about this kind of stuff. A lot of UFO sightings. A lot of Bigfoot sightings. Just to let you know, I did a deep, deep dive on Stephen's disappearance. Never found. Never turned up. A, very much a whodunit. So, our website is NA. Our website store is NA, like North America, BigfootSearch.com. You can watch our movies on Amazon, Missing 411, Missing 411, The Hunted, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. Yeah, you may want to watch that. In the meantime, be nice to your family, be nice to your neighbors, do something for your community, and always remember, you are greatly appreciated right here. Politis out.